Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Just while they're doing that, what we believe is an interesting thing. I, uh, I was, I'd put Riley to bed Thursday night while mum and Chris were at music and um, uh, he wanted three stories even though it was 7.15 already. Um, so I said, we'll do some Jesus stories tonight. So we did, we did the feeding of the 5,000, you know, the boy with his loaves and fishes. And uh, we did another one. I can't remember what we did. And then he said, I want another one. So just one more. So I told him the story of the man with the withered hand. Okay. You know, so this man who Jesus met whose hand was, was withered and crippled. And how, you know, how Jesus spotted it and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he said, I can't, Jesus, because I've got with the Dan. Can't you see what the problem is? But Jesus said, no, you do it. So, uh, you know, I told Riley as he did it, I thought he tried to stretch out his hand. Suddenly he could. And, uh, you know, his hand was healed and it was all wonderful. And that's what Jesus did. So Riley said, immediately said, granddad, granddad, stretch out your hand. Because he knows that I've got a fused, two fused finger joints on this finger because of five surgeries that didn't fix it. And I thought, when you talk about the faith of a child, his immediate thought was, if that's what happened to the man in the temple, why hasn't that happened to your hand, granddad? Now, these are the challenges of faith that sometimes we can do mental and verbal gymnastics to try and get around, but we ain't fooling nobody. So I don't know whether I don't have the faith. See, people would say, oh, either you don't have the faith, or I'd say, no, it's him that doesn't have the faith. <laughs> Blame Riley. <laughs> the issue is I was very challenged by just the simplicity that he, well, if Jesus told that man to stretch out his hand, let's reach that place. A lot of people need a touch. People like Jean, bless your heart, you know, sweetheart, come turning in here so often in pain and yet so faithful. So Jesus, help us. Father, wh whatever we need, whatever it is, just, just let a touch from heaven come, especially on Jean tonight and on others in Jesus' name. All right, the kids, if you haven't already gone, you can, you can disappear and we're going to talk for a, a few minutes. Okay, um, let me say a few things about tonight. I'm going to talk to you about a word or six to the wise. Um, but you need to know a little, a little back story. Um, when 5.15 came uh, this evening, I, I radically changed my message. I'd been preparing all day and on what I was going to speak, but 5.15 tonight, um, now, it's interesting because this whole weekend, I, I can honestly say, without, without any sense of personal pride, I've been hearing God. Now, we're always kind of hearing God in various ways, that, but there's sometimes when you just, you know that voice and you're hearing, you're hearing God speak to you, and um, yeah, this, this was part of that process of the weekend. 5.15. Um, some of you need to listen to me. I can save your life. I've throughout my life watched many times where this has happened to me. I remember one time standing up here and saying, okay, here's what God's put on my heart. The children of Israel over 40 days made decisions that would affect their life for the next 40 years. Uh, and I remember imploring the people at that time that this was so critically important. And there were decisions made in those 40 days that have affected lives for 40 years and not necessarily for the better. And those stories I can't share because they're personal and private. I remember just a few years ago being sat down here ready to preach. I didn't come up on the stage. I stayed down here because God was speaking to me very clearly about something that I spoke out that was an instruction, a warning, a help, 
And uh, there are some people I know now that wouldn't be in the situation that they're in right now if they had listened, not necessarily to me, but to the fact that God was saying something into their lives at that moment. So there are times, and I sincerely believe it, I've known it in my own life, where there are moments that we must engage with what it is that's being said because what is being said is important. So what I'm about to talk to you about, some of it I already had in my spirit to stay from Friday, but most of it um, just came alive in me this evening. And, um, uh, yeah, so I want to just pray. Father, help us just, just let our hearts be soft and receptive to what you need to say because we believe there are some important things going on in lives tonight and decisions in people, and we want, we want your blessing to to overwhelm everything, in Jesus' name, amen. So, do you know what, for most of us, is the greatest fear? Pretty consistent across all this building. Now, you might say, well, I'm afraid of spiders, I'm afraid of this. But there is one thing that for almost all of us, if not every single one of us, is the greatest fear that we face in all of our lives. And that fear is the fear of the light. Fear of the light. There are far more people afraid of the light than have ever been afraid of the dark. The issue is when it's the light, living in the light is, is where we live in total honesty and therefore are at our most vulnerable, especially if we have decided or feel we are in a hostile environment, we run from the light. We don't like the light of honesty. And then trust becomes an issue, and rightly so. But I want you to bear in mind that the first, in a sense, transformational miracle that God introduced into creation was let there be light which is fascinating because I do not strongly believe that the, the first book of Genesis was ever intended to be a science manual about how the earth came into being. I think there's truth there, and I think it's important. And I'm not saying God didn't create the earth. I believe in a creator. As much as I don't believe that you can have a work of art without an artist... I don't believe that you can have creation without a creator. As much as I believe you can't have a building like this without a builder, I don't believe that you can have everything that's built in the earth without a creator. Makes a lot of sense to me. So I think the lessons of Genesis chapter 1 are much more critical than this is how God made the earth. I think the lessons are, this is how God changes people's lives. This is how darkness is transformed. This is how you get things to work in the way they were supposed to work. And the first thing we read is God said, let there be light. If you are a bit of a scholar of the text and you put it into context, you will realize that whatever it was that existed was in disarray and disorder. Therefore, switching on the light was not a pleasant experience because you saw things as they really are. Every one of us, at some point in our lives, or even right now, are afraid to see things as they really are. So we go through emotional and mental and psychological gymnastics to make things appear to be something that we can accept and are palatable to us because we are afraid of the light. Isn't it therefore fascinating that one of the dominant features of the coming of this person called Jesus the Christ is that I am the light of the world. The world wasn't very nice. We weren't very nice. So for light to come doesn't mean that everything bad disappears. It means that you see everything that's bad and needs fixing clearer, sharper, so that then by grace you can attend to what really matters. Many people, and many of you in here are living a lie. Because you will not let the light work on what is the truth 
and then deal with the truth so we find excuses for the truth. Now, let me show you a little biblically what happens. We don't even have to get past the first three chapters of Genesis to understand that because we are exposed to this very principle where people hide from God. So we get the creation of humans. And what do we hear? That Adam hid. They hid from God. Why would you hide from God? Why would you do that? Their words were, I was afraid of God of the, or the light. I was afraid because I was seeing truth that I was not comfortable with. Therefore, I figured if I can hide that truth or hide from the truth, I will feel okay. But all it produced was a fear. The fascinating thing is that the very fact that Adam and Eve would hide from God showed that they did not trust God's intentions towards them. Let me tell you something. People still hide from the truth because you do not trust the intentions of people towards you. But we try to make it right. So what was their strategy? When God came to Adam, he said, it was the woman that you gave me. If this hadn't have happened, if that wasn't done, if she hadn't have been treated this way, I'd be okay. And then when he comes to the woman, it was the serpent who deceived me, and I ate. And I still watch those models come. I hear people say, do you know, the enemy's really at work. Which being interpreted is the serpent, you see, it was the serpent, it was the devil. I've stopped blaming devils, demons, or as some people, a misplaced understanding of the will of God. I understand that with humanity, things happen in our lives and we need to expose ourselves to the light. But I'm going to tell you honestly, which is why I'm bringing this, some of you are not willing to do that. Because being exposed to the light brings discomfort, it brings struggle, and so what we tend to do is look for somebody to blame. We look for the path of least resistance and we begin to accept things that we should have never accepted because we are not prepared to live in the light. If you are a person who doesn't talk to anybody about anything, don't talk to anybody about anything. Because what that usually means is I don't talk to some people about most things. And then it becomes hypocrisy. It's not honesty. We are afraid to live in the light. And sometimes many of us are afraid to live in the light with our own feelings and thoughts and opinions. Most of us are not aware that we may be displaying the classic symptoms of being afraid of the light because we don't see our behavior as being dishonest or evil in any way. We have this wonderful way of perceiving that what we are doing is not dishonest, it's not evil because, 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 because. When actually it covers the truth. If we whisper in corners, if we gossip on private Facebooking, if we're making phone calls that are not able to be open and inclusive, the truth is we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and they are the classic symptoms of being afraid of the light and not seeing our behavior as being dishonest or evil in any way. Jesus said something very important, John chapter 3 and verse 19 through 21, and I want to read it to you. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. This is Jesus speaking. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Now listen to verse 21. This is the explanation. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he or she has done has been done through God. So the measure of whether what you or I have done has been done through God is whether we bring the truth into the light so that it can be seen plainly. 
We have tried as leaders in this house to live our lives very vulnerable and very open and very honestly because we learned that the way of truth is the way of blessing. The way of truth is the way of restoration. And therefore it hurts sometimes when we see that, 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 that sometimes we can't expose what we're doing because, because we can't show that it has been done through God. Let me say another couple of things. In verse 20, we have the word evil. Let me explain. In the Greek, this word is nearer. Sorry, in verse 20, it says, everyone who does evil or wickedness in some versions hates the light. So what does that mean? How, how do I know if I'm a hater of the light? Well, you need to know what that word evil or wickedness means. In the Greek, that word is nearer to flawed behavior with its use of evil and wicked. So whoever lives in flawed behavior or with a flawed behavior will not come into the light. There are parts of our behavior that can be flawed because we will not live openly and honestly before all people, only in a designed honesty before some people, which is usually to the detriment of other people, which is why we can't live open with all people. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in verse 19, it uses the same word, evil, but it's actually a different Greek word. It says, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word evil, I'm thinking of wickedness and murderers and rapists and, you know, kind of the worst kind of badness. But, but, but very often in the Bible, evil doesn't mean that at all, which is why then when we read this, that, well, I'm not evil, my deeds are not evil because I'm not murderer, I'm not a rapist, I'm not into child pornography, I'm not, because we misunderstand the translation of the word. That word evil in verse 19 is nearer to being hurtful in effect and influence. Being hurtful in effect and influence. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were hurtful in effect and influence. Now the question is, hurtful to who? How many of you know if I only respond to one party, I become hurtful to another party? But I don't think I'm being hurtful because I'm being compassionate, I think, to this party. But then I can't be honest about what's going on with this party because if I'm honest, this party might not like what I'm doing with this party. So instead of walking in the light, I have to walk in Darkness, but it doesn't look like darkness. It looks like compassion and care and love, but it's only a kind of compassion, let care and love in one aspect to one person in one situation, but it's hurtful to somebody else. That's why gossip is not good. That's why we have to be careful when we are told stories about what somebody said about somebody to somebody, for somebody, did to somebody, did towards somebody. Because when we hear those things, very often we begin to live in the darkness and not in the light because we are only responding to what we heard and we will not be open because our fear is what will happen if I'm open. And I appreciate that comes down to trust. But I want you to recognize it came down to trust with Adam and Eve. Their declaration really was, I'm hiding because I don't really trust what God will do next. Which is a very interesting thing. Also, one of the other ways that we mask our fear of the light, I was afraid. I was too scared to be honest. I was too scared to say. I was too scared to deal with it. Isn't it fascinating that that was the Adam and Eve response that tried to throw God off the trail? Well, I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked. So I didn't want to expose where I was, who I was, what I was doing, what I was thinking, because I was afraid of you, God. I've heard that so many times, and I've pulled that stunt myself on occasions as well. Because I didn't like what might be the conclusion to the exposure of the truth that I was dealing with. So we love darkness rather than the light. 
because of our flawed behaviors and not realizing that it makes us hurtful in effect and influence. Therefore, not to walk in the light can never produce life. Anything that's covered up never produces life. Anything that lives in any kind of dishonesty, no matter how much we dress it up with flowers and beauty, can never bring life. I often say at funeral services, you can bring all the perfumes you wish, you can bring all the flowers you wish, you can have all the cards that you wish, but none of it makes death become life. The death is still death. And humanity has a track record of trying to make death smell nice or to apportion blame for it somewhere else. That's why the Bible talks about truth and it talks about honesty and it talks about light. We're often afraid of the light because of what the light will expose in us as well as what we like to expose in others. And I've learned something in my life that, um, you know, I went through a phase where where in, in the Christian church at large, there was a phase in the 70s and 80s when some of you weren't even born, um, of speaking the truth in love, which usually meant me speaking the truth in love to you, or you, or you, but don't say anything back, because then it shows you don't love me. I'm like, so, so if I say something back, that's a judgment, which was the common response. You're judging me, but for you, I'm saying this to you in love. Do you understand the conflict that is there? That's the kind of darkness I'm talking about. It didn't look like darkness because it looked like somebody was being obedient to Scripture and speaking the truth in love, but it wasn't also receiving the truth in love. Then it was, you're judging me, but I'm not judging you. And it leaves our hearts in disarray, and it breaks relationships, and it separates us from life, and it separates us from each other, and causes division, what Paul calls division or schism, rips, tears in the body of Christ, most of it because we won't live in the light. I said something I don't apologize for saying, but heck, when I watched some of the results of it, I said some weeks ago that I had this tremendous sense that having left behind the prophetic on my life for so long, it was now coming back. Somebody clapped, and I, I didn't mean to cause anybody embarrassment, but my answer was, you might not want to clap. The reason for that was is because in the prophetic you know stuff and you see stuff and some of that stuff I'd rather not know and I'd rather not see. But let me tell you what sometimes the prophetic does when people know and sense that the prophetic is around which is the light of truth, they run. Because rather than deal with what it is that that may expose, we find a place where we can fluff it around and make it nice and make it lovely so we don't have to deal with it. Well, I'm going to tell you why you don't need to fear the prophetic in this house. I'm going to tell you why you don't need to fear the truth in this house. And I'm going to tell you why we ought to partner together in the context of truth in the house. Now, Jenny last week brought a great message. It just I know she struggled for what she was going to say, and I thought it was amazing. I don't know about you. And uh, if you remember, Jenny talked about grudges, which is very interesting in the context. And she showed a cartoon, um, which is this one. So the guy in the middle is carrying a grudge. But his typical answer, which comes most of the time, no, it's not mine, I'm holding it for a friend. How many of you are holding grudges for a friend? None of us, I can tell. I'll tell you why none of us, because we don't call them grudges. How many of you heard the phrase, a rose by any other name is still a rose. A grudge by any other name is still a grudge. An offense by any other name is still an offense. A judgment by any other name 
is still a judgment. And unforgiveness, by any other name, is still an unforgiveness. Let me tell you what happens when we carry a grudge for someone. We stop that person living in the light. And therefore it becomes, you don't need to deal with this grudge or this offense or this judgment because your grudge, your offense, your judgment is justified. And therefore I must support you in this because it's a legitimate offense, a legitimate judgment, a legitimate grudge. How many of you know there is no such a thing? And if we are followers of Jesus, we cannot make room for there to be such a thing in what is called the body of Christ. We have to call it what it is. Now again, I'm going to tell you why you don't need to fear accepting you have a, a grudge. Why you don't need to fear accepting why you have an offense. Why you don't need to fear accepting that you have a judgment in this place. Because Jesus said the same thing about offenses and about judgments as this carrying a grudge on here. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. Bear one another's burdens, not bear one another's grudges. It's far easier to bear a grudge with someone than it is to bear the burden of saying, it's not appropriate for you to have a grudge or for you to have an offense. It may legitimately be that you have felt that, and nobody is excusing that process. But to encourage that that is okay, means that rather than bearing a person's burdens, we bear their grudge with them. Now, let me tell you something that is wisdom I learned many years ago. Some of you have not heard it, some of you need to hear it again. But take my word for it, it's very important. Jesus said if you have anything against a brother or a sister or a man or a woman, go to them and tell them what that is and sort it out between the two of you. Because here's the problem. Jesus was saying there is grace for that action. Something from God that helps us work that through. But there is nothing in the Bible that says when you tell someone else and they tell someone else, and you all feel that thing about this person, that there is grace for that. There is no grace for that. It's called third-party offense. The Bible says there is a grace for first-party offense, and we get offended. We get offended with each other. I get offended with you at times. You get offended with me. We get offended with each other at various things that we dislike, we don't like, we feel weren't appropriate. But there is a grace for that when we deal that with each other. But once that goes beyond that measure, Jesus never gave us, and God never gave us, and the Bible never gives us a grace that says, if we pass that on a third party, and then we encourage that together, there is no grace in that. All that can come from that is death. Don't be afraid of the light. So, let me say a couple of things and I'll run you on to these three things as to why. I'm going to paraphrase something that Jesus said on a couple of occasions. Here's the paraphrase because you'll understand it better. I'm talking, but you're not listening. Now, the, the poetic language was having ears you do not hear, having eyes you do not see. Summary, in modern language, Jesus said, I'm talking to you, but you're not listening. And he gave a reason. He said, the reason you're not listening is because if you were to hear what I'm saying and see what I'm showing you, then you would have to change what you have done and how you are acting and what you are encouraging. And basically, Jesus' word was, and you don't want to do that, so you stop listening to what I'm telling you. Open your ears. Open your eyes. It will help you. These are the words of Jesus. You're not, I'm talking, but you're not listening. Now, I believe Jesus is talking to us. I believe he's talking to us about grudges last week. I believe he's talking to us this week about walking in the light. But some of you might not be listening because if you do listen, the result of listening 
And it caused a lot of distress. I remember a dear old guy called Jamie Buckingham years ago wrote a book. The title of the book was The Truth Will Set You Free, But First It Will Make You Miserable. Which I thought was a fantastic title for a book. And you know what? He's right. Usually the truth makes us miserable before it sets us free. It makes us miserable because of what we see in ourselves, for what we see when light comes on the situation. And then what we know must be the action to correct this. And we draw near to the light. We don't run from the light. Sunglasses and eye shades are not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Well, I find the light too blinding, but Jesus said, Lo, here are the sunglasses. Here are the shades to protect you from the brightness of the light. No, he said, you need to look into the full brightness of that light and let it speak to your own life first, and then let that light emanate from you so that we have honesty and integrity in all that we do, and that we are not upholding that which the Bible calls evil, that which is hurtful, in effect an influence that is flawed behavior. So, six words. Okay, I call this a word or six to the wise. Six words as to why you don't need to feel the light. and Why you don't need to feel living in the light in this house. First two words, judgment and consequence. There is a difference between a judgment and a consequence. Some people can't figure that out. So they think because something happens, it must be a judgment. And it's been one of the problems that the church has not clarified, is that if something bad happens to me, it must be a judgment. Well... I ask you a simple question. If I go out on a busy Monday morning into the rush hour in York for what that is, and I step out into the flow of traffic without warning, and I get hit by a bus, is that a judgment or is that a consequence? But how many of you know the consequence is not pleasant? But the consequence is the connected sequence of things that happen when I make choices that are foolish. There's a wonderful verse in the book of John. John writes these words. He says, moreover, the Father judges no one. Did you know that? That, that that's what John wrote about the Father. The Father, God judges no one. But he has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And guess what the Son did? He gave himself... To make a covenant that would free you from judgment. So the issue is not when we walk in the light that, well, if I walk in the light, I'll be judged. You will not be judged. However, may I say that if your choices are foolish, there will be consequences. If I've told untruths to people, if I've said the wrong things, if I've emboldened something, then the truth is there will be consequences that I may have to face. Now, thank God there is grace and mercy in the midst of the consequences of our life, but some things we just have to see them out of our lives, but they are not judgments. Now, I also want to say this. When we make stupid decisions, I don't believe we come under the judgment of God. But I think we can bring consequences on ourselves. We can bring consequences on our family. We can bring consequences on others around us because we made silly choices. Choices are important, not from the measure of if I make the wrong one, I'll be judged but from the part of if we don't make good choices, we suffer the consequences and grace is with us, but judgment and consequence are two different things. I can guarantee you that you will not be judged in this house if you walk in the light. However, I don't know that I can stop all the consequences. Two other words, acceptance and approval, two different things. Acceptance is one thing, approval is another. Acceptance is when I engage and embrace with you as you are. 
which is a wonderful thing. God accepts us, whoever we are, wherever we've come from, whatever we've done, we are accepted. Approval is another thing. Approval is when I say, not only do I accept you, but I absolutely affirm your choices, your behaviors. Now, there are many things that I, I, I don't approve of, some because I don't understand, some because I've never been there, some because I, I don't think they're the best life choices. But that doesn't mean that we can't accept and accept fully, 100% totally. And then if we're walking in the light, we can have the honesty and the integrity to walk through the things that when you say, I don't feel that you approve of me, the best thing is not you shouldn't. The question would be why? And then we can have honest conversations that bring us all to a place of love and peace and consideration because acceptance and approval are two different things. If you're looking for approval, I might not always be able to give it to you. If you're looking for acceptance, you can have it every day of the week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But this is where the problem comes. Some people are looking for me to approve their behavior, approve their choices, approve their opinions, approve what they think about stuff, approve what they have believed. And if you don't approve of me, we can't walk together. When it should be acceptance. Will you accept me? with all my flaws. Because if you accept me and I accept you, approval may or may not come. But approval does not build healthy relationships. Approval builds false relationships, which is why so many of you are running around looking for approval from your friends, from your parents who never gave it to you. I'm still trying to rescue a little boy in some areas at 61. Areas that I wanted approval. Still trying to rescue. Approval is not the objective. Acceptance is the objective of grace. So we go from, we go to acceptance, we go to understand consequence, and then there are two other words which I'm going to say because I need to finish. Reward and favor are not the same thing. Now Chris and I have interesting conversations about this because we come from a different place of thought. Reward and favor are not the same thing. You see, the problem is if you believe in reward and God is just, he has to reward you equally for what you think is good and what he thinks is bad. How many of you know which side the scale's mostly gonna tip? Especially when Jesus said, look, if you wanna do pull the self-righteousness nonsense with me, even if you think something, You've as good as done it because it happened in your heart. So it's the whole issue. If we're measuring things by reward, will God reward me for doing good? Well, if he rewards you for doing good, he's got to reward you for doing bad, which, which is called punishment. That's paganism. It's not Christianity. It's not the God of the Bible. That's paganism. Favor is a different thing. You see, reward is earned, favor is bestowed. Reward is earned, favor is bestowed. I am looking to live in the place of favor. If I live in the place of acceptance, if I live in the place of light, I come then into the place of favor, where favor begins to work in my life. Now, favor is something very interesting, because favor is not something you give towards yourself. Favor is something that somebody else gives you. And when you are in the favor that somebody else gives you, that's happening outside of your remit and control. All you have to do is make sure you live where that favor is. How many of you know it can be raining cats and dogs? Not literal cats and dogs, but raining cats and dogs. And you can put up an umbrella and it doesn't touch you. So everything and everybody is getting drenched and you're not. Because you had a way of stopping that favor which comes on the earth touching you. I believe that the favor of God is like that. And I believe when we live in darkness, we put up an umbrella to the favor. I believe when we live in condemnation and criticism and bearing judges, 
We might think we're okay, but we've put up an umbrella to the favor. And it's only when we get in a time of drought, which might be too late, that we realize we stopped ourselves receiving what it was that we needed to receive because we put up our umbrella. Favor is not something you earn. Favor is something you put yourself under. But if you have a fear of the light, you will exclude yourself from the place of favor. It's not always nice getting rained on, is it? I hate rain. I love what it does, but I hate rain. I have got umbrellas in all the cars that we have. I ain't, if I can avoid it, I am not going out. I do not like rain. I don't like getting wet. Now, Chris is more durable. She's like, oh, it's only a bit of rain. Not to me, it isn't. Why? Because I don't like what happens when you get wet. Your hair goes all gungy and you're soaked and your clothes stick to your skin. And so rain is wonderful and rain brings harvest, but sometimes that thing that brings harvest can feel unpleasant when you put yourself under it. When actually it has within it life because it's a favor on the earth. May I propose to you that when you live in the light, Sometimes it's like getting rained on by the heaviest rainstorm you've ever been in with thundering and lightning, but you're under the favor that's falling on the earth. And we re resist, we reject, and we, we put a barrier up against the favor of God when we refuse to live in the light. So let me finish. 1 Peter 4 verse 8, above all. Okay, above all. Love the people that you like deeply. Above all, love the people that you relate to the best deeply. Above all, love the people who you can understand where they feel the way they feel deeply. Unfortunately, the descriptions I just gave is most of how that's outworked. But if we're going to do it the God way, if we're going to do it the Jesus way, here's what it says. Moreover, no, sorry, um, above all, well, what does above all mean? It means this has to be the superior objective that if you put this in place, you will never fear walking in the light. Above all, love who? Each other deeply. Why? Because love covers over a multitude of sins, right? For everybody, not just my love covers over the sins of some, because that means others are to blame, but love covers a multitude of sins for everybody. Love doesn't cause modification in behavior. Love changes people. Therefore, above all, love each other deeply. It will change you and it will change the people that you're loving unless the people you're loving is a false love because you're walking in the darkness rather than the light and embracing the deeds which are evil which means then actually in, in the face of God, the love is not valid because it's not love at all. It's something we call in psychology enabling, which is not love, and I've got a lot to learn about that. So here's where we finish. If you truly live in the light, you live in Jesus. For he said, I am the light of the world. If your intent is free from evil as described, you will have no fear of living in honesty. But if you have a fear of living in honesty, your life is full of evil as described. Do you get that? He goes, that's the flip. And if that honesty is painful in its vulnerability, you can know there is no judgment no rejection and no reward 
only favor to look forward to. Father, just help us to receive what you're telling us tonight, what you're speaking into our lives, speaking into me, speaking into all of us. And may we walk in the light as you are in the light because then the fellowship, the friendship, the connection we have with one another is one that is from heaven. It's one that's from you. It's one that endures. So help us to be an honest people in all of our situation, to walk that through in the fullness of your grace, knowing that in that place there is only favor, only favor, and we want to live in that favor. So Father, I commit this word by your hands into the hearts of these people, by your spirit, make it work, and don't modify our behavior, and I pray that we will be changed by love in Jesus' name, amen. We love you. Stay behind. Have a cup of coffee, cup of tea, have a chat, and we'll see you hopefully on Wednesday. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.